Uh, welcome, if I haven't met you yet. Um, thank you so much for coming to CCAD. We are excited to have Mark Linnevelt here with us tonight, but I want to tell you about a few upcoming events before we get on with the show. As you may know, CCAD was founded in 1879. So if you can do the math, this year we're celebrating our 140th anniversary. We've got all kinds of events happening throughout the year, uh, and many of those um, key events that we have will also be infused with celebrations of our 140th. So don't forget uh, this spring to make sure you come back many times. Uh, come back on April 6th for our uh, annual spring art fair. Uh, wait, no, that's April. Yeah, April 6th. And the night before, on Friday night, April 5th, uh, you'll uh, be able to come and see the exhibition opening for what will be both the MFA thesis exhibition as well as the MDES first uh, sort of inaugural class uh, thesis uh, theses as well. Um, then in May, of course, we have Chroma, which is our best of CCAD uh, end of year exhibition, and that is uh, the 140th end of year student exhibition. So that is on Wednesday, May 8th. And on Saturday, or Friday, gosh, I'm trying to not look at my notes and remember all these dates, but it's a lot. Uh, Friday, May 10th of, is our annual fashion show. So there, there are a ton of upcoming events, as well as more visiting artists and lecture series. Um, a great show right next door in the Beeler Gallery. So make sure you experience it all here on campus throughout the spring. Um, in addition to that, uh, speaking of the Masters of Design program, I want to make sure that you all know that the program is still accepting applications for fall. So if you are interested in um, being part of the third class of this really exciting uh, Masters of Design and Integrative Design program here at CCAD, you can um, check that out and learn more at ccad.edu slash mdes. Um, be sure to pick up a calendar of events or all of this information, of course, is available about our events at ccad.edu slash calendar. Um, and finally, I want to thank um, all of our sponsors who make this programming possible. So the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, the Skestos Endowment Fund for Visiting Artists and Lectures, and the CD1025. Uh, and a lot of our funding from these organizations is based on data from events like this. So be sure to grab a survey tonight on the way out and fill that out. It's a really short demographic survey that helps us let our um, uh, funders know who comes and uh, attends these event events. So thank you again for joining us tonight. I, for one, am really looking forward to the talk, uh, and I will turn things over to Masters of Design Chair, Merce Grayel, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks. Thank you, um, hello and welcome. This is now our second sp uh, speaker in this series of exploring how in this new paradigm of design, designing for experience, for a strategy, um, different contexts are solving problems. Uh, if you were here when we had Richard Perez from Dr. and Gamble, we saw how we solve problems from an engineering uh, point of view. And here we have a person that Mark will introduce himself better than I'm going to do, that solves problems with his heart and his guts. Thank you. Ah. Yes, thing. nice, yeah, <laughs> heart and guts, <laughs> intuition. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here, um, and I, I'm pleased you had a speaker recently, previous to this talk, which was probably more uh, logical and practical and um, intellectual. Um, my stuff <laughs> is definitely not... Uh, going to be uh, like any answer to questions of knowing stuff. Mine is more silly, light-hearted, uh, and like you were saying, Mose, is you know more more kind of intuitive. That's I can only tell you the story of my creative life um, and show you some work that maybe would hopefully be inspiring when you guys are trying to solve problems. Um, so. I would kind of made this title because when I was uh, when I finished studying graphic design, uh, my colleagues and I used to talk about this life, the universe, and advertising. We had huge dreams of doing great things, and uh, it's kind of stuck with me forever. Um, all I can tell you is I, th I think my life, being an art director and then a creative director, has been like fantastic career-wise. 
I couldn't think of uh, a better discipline to spend my time doing because it's uh, for me it's uh, it's casual. It's uh, I've never worn a suit to work. I'm not a businessman. Um, I remember being in my 20s out of art school, going to work, and just looking at the people in traffic who were going to work. And I was like, just those poor souls. Um, <laughs> so I literally try and you know, use that spirit every day with people who work with me, is we do some magic. We offer some, some beautiful uh, pause to the world. We're not trying to um, maybe save the world, but we're certainly trying to do some good. I guess at this point I say like 99% of pure advertising, possibly design fits into that case, is awful, is bad. You know, I'm, I, I'm here with a case of uh, trying to do things that make a difference, that are actually worthwhile watching. So hopefully you can kind of check me on that. Um, so I'm going to start with a little video. Um, and it kind of, I've been using this uh, recently. I've been showing this to clients before I start a meeting. If we, we walk into a room and we're going to present some work or we're going to discuss some, some stuff, I kind of have been kicking off with this. And it's a, yes, it's a, it's a five-year-old, it's a little five-year-old boy whose father, a friend of mine, um, showed him some logos. And uh, you get to hear the thoughts and the, the insights from the five-year-old. He matches the color of the restaurant. And that is the coffee logo. That is a parade outfit. <laughs> that is the Disney. And those are little worms. That looks like an M. But upside down, M's are W's. That is the Apple Store logo, and it has a bite of an apple in it. Ooh, looks like the American flag. A bell. Outside space. Looks like a shooting star with a planet. An eye. Chili. And it has an S next to it. And chili is spicy. That looks like a beach ball. Beach balls are very colorful. And the GE logo. That's where my grandpa works. Babies. <laughs> Are little gas. That is a cheetah. A cheetah. Cheetah. A letter O. But it has a dot in it. An M from McDonald's, and it looks like a fry, but it's an M made out of fry. On a car. It's a pizza. A turkey. That's very colorful, like the rainbow. The Nike. That is coffee again. Maybe on a restaurant. That looks like a marble. The sad is on a control that you use to control the TV at Ryan's house. Panda bears live out in the woods, I think. Baby toys. Those look like baby toys. <laughs> so, isn't that gorgeous? Um, you know, I, we, we, we do the serious stuff for clients. They spend a lot of money trying to be at an ad campaign, be at a design issue, be at a new product launch. And they come in with their computers and their suits on and their ties up and their, their attitudes and their business uh, missions and their agendas and when we try to do work that needs to have some magic that needs to connect to people in real life um, this disarms them and I kind of it's worked so well I wish I used it every time because it, you know I think sometimes the the seriousness of what we do kind of negates the magic you know the 
the information, you lose the imagination. Uh, the logic sometimes gives you terrible things that people don't connect with. So I think a five-year-old having a relationship already with brands is, is, is fantastic. So, you know, as a, as a patron of a, of a campaign, it's great to see clients. I'd, I like to get them to think more with their in intuition. It's like, that's a crazy idea, let's do it. As opposed to let's not do it because it's crazy. <laughs> um, so my story, back to, you know, I'm gonna show you some of my work. Um, and I, I, it, for me, it makes sense now the way I think is because I, I was born and I, I did spend most of my life in South Africa. And it feels like that <laughs> when, you, when you live, you know, Cape Town is on the southern tip of Africa. It's beautiful, but it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit like Australia or New Zealand. You know, you feel like everything's happening somewhere else. Um, I felt like everything I aspire to not just me, everyone around me, or you know, things that we we craved, TV, film, like Nike, like all these things as kids was happening in New York or Los Angeles or Paris or London. It's like a fragrance bottle. It wasn't <coughs> like there was no Cape Town or Johannesburg uh, mentioned in those. So we were, I think, as a as a you know as a as a culture, uh, we were hungry. We were ambitious. We wanted, you know, so when I, as I said, when I finished studying graphic design and I, I joined an agency, I joined TBWA, Hunt Lascaris, which was a tiny agency, fantastic company that grew to be famous. Um, John Hunt, the founder, the creative director, you know, he was like, we don't want to be the best in Africa. We want to be the best in the world. And it was like insane because there's, there's so much more money, there's so many, so many more brands, there's so many more opportunities to do well in first world countries. You know, so we used to attack award shows like Cannes, DNAD, the one show, Art Directors Club, and to dominate those from South Africa, we could only do it with ideas. Um, America would, would have a thousand entries and we would have three. I'm just using that as a ratio. You know, so if we entered Cannes uh, as a country, uh, we were thinking as ourselves as a country trying to make an impact on the global stage. I think people in America were just like doing stuff and like entering awards and didn't really care. Maybe you'd get a, you know, um, a bonus or a, or a pay raise. But we were on a mission. <laughs> um, so I think that's kind of the spirit of my talk um, is, is what I was taught at that agency, my first job. Thank God I went to Hunt Lascaris. I could have gone to Ogilvy. I could have gone to McCann. Those were bigger agencies in South Africa and I would have got more money, um, but I wouldn't have learned this, this kind of raw spirit that John Hunt had. Um, and it's, I mean, this is all like super obvious. Be original, think different, do the unexpected, break the rules. We lived that, you know, we were like the pirates. Ogilvy was the Navy. They were so boring. We were gonna like take them out. We were a shark in the water. That was our, you know, we were a bunch of renegades. And that's kind of a, that's almost a, something to keep in mind if you choose where you're going to work, make sure you can choose a place that's, that has the freedom to do different things. Um, if you do all those things, you're fine. <laughs> Obviously, you know, your ex-girlfriends or boyfriends will rue the day they left you. <laughs> you, you know, you'll be, you'll be famous. You'll do awesome stuff. And the, the trick is to do that and then you know when I say my life's been amazing as in terms of what I do the the reality is it's been a fight a constant fight against mediocrity everyone is trying to kill great ideas you know so all the things you're doing no one's out there waiting for you to do it and helping you going to support you everyone's going to try and block you that's what I learned you know, for us to be 
original, it flies in the face of most clients. The people who have the money don't want to be original. That's risky, you know? So if you, if you can be persuasive and you can do stuff, you'll, you'll do a better job. It's, a, it's kind of a catch-22. But the fight <laughs> is to do this stuff. Um, so, my beginning, my first, I think this was like the third thing I did uh, when I was at Hunter Scarus. And it was, uh, it was a business card. So, studying graphic design, I chose to get into art direction because I felt it was more, uh, there was more variety in what I could do in terms of film and um, kind of more communication, more conceptual thinking. I loved the fact that we're talking to so many million people on projects as opposed to uh, doing stuff that, which I didn't know a logo could actually talk to the planet. But so I was my first job given a design project. And there's my first business card for a lawyer in Cape Town. Uh, the twist is we printed them on get out of jail free cards from Monopoly. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, here's the first lesson. Ideas are king. If you have a great idea, you don't need much execution sometimes. Just let the idea get out there. So, there, you know, the design is pretty standard, but it's, it's, on a, it's on a get out of jail card, and this card may be kept till needed or sold. Julian was like loving this. Um, and the thing that happened was I won a DNA D pencil. Like, <laughs> that's a, w you know, my first year in advertising and I win the most difficult to win, prestigious, like, freak show award. The DNA D is notoriously difficult to win. I mean, it's a fantastic award and it's, it's, uh, it's not like an ad award because it's design and art direction. And they, they recognize um, like real quality thinking and craft. And it's, you know, if the ratio of winning to entries are up like crazy small. So if you, if you can get a pencil, it's really something. And I had the misfortune of getting one like in my first year. Because um, I've only won three in my 30 years of advertising. So it was a hard thing to follow. But the point is that simple idea got me noticed and I got better briefs and more important people spoke to me. Um, so that's, that set me off in the right place. I was like, man, an idea, it doesn't matter. Like people around me were working on huge TV commercials at that time. W the one thing you'll notice as I go through my early work is like it's from a different time. You know, it's like such a simple time when things were more pure and easy and compact. You, you know, now it's, it's like massively exciting because there's so much you can do. But, it, you know, I'm talking about it as print or TV or radio. Um, what else was there? Cinema. <laughs> um, so from that, oh, forgot about that. This is, um, this is like 20 years ago. So I lost my train of thought here. I think the, the fact that I won for that little business card put me in the same company as massive, like legendary people. This is a, this is a Honda film from like, as I said, 20 years ago. Um, and I, when I went to London to get my pencil, um, I was, you know, connecting with people who were doing things like this. This film, you, you may know, it's Honda, Cog. Uh, I'd love it because I just remembered it when I was you know, looking at that pencil again. Um, it, like, it took them two years to make this film. Uh, it's all done in camera. It's one take. Uh, I think the, it took them two years to make, but I think it took them four years to do the entire project. And I thought, wow, that's kind of craft. That's not like just rushing something and cutting the budget and getting it out by June because we have deadlines. So this is Honda Cog.
advice when things just work? You know, that's a, you can't argue with the, you know, just the craft, the love that was put into that. Um, there's a beautiful documentary to watch uh, in the filmmaking, um, a French director, uh, 300 takes before they got that one. Um, that's 300 setups again of that entire sequence. Um, you know, nowadays we would easily cheat that and it's less rewarding it's less impactful so there's something about you know seeing stuff like that um so i was i was inspired by some who i thought were these creative people who who just believed in something enough to get a client to do that kind of work it's like wow it's possible to not just do the the stuff you see on tv every day um so this was still in south africa and uh, Levi's moved, opened an actual head office in South Africa as opposed to just importing Levi's. And we worked on the business. And in those days, I think Levi's was a massive, iconic advertising brand. So I worked on a 501 campaign because I was this young upstart who had, that had a DNA D pencil. I wouldn't have worked on this, I don't think, if I wasn't in that space. So. We did this. Um, it was a campaign, um, and it's just a coat hanger, which we just put on a photostat machine. And um, if you, I, I use this to remind those of us looking at this to see what, this is kind of what was out there. And this is my, it's kind of the simplest thing that I do is don't do what other people do. That's the easiest first step. Is like in every category, like that Honda car ad, you know what car ads actually look like. There's a car, it's always driving. It's in the right time of, it's in the like sunset or sunrise. The beautiful reflections going over it. It's going down a beautiful road. You see the interior. It's like, that. that's what car ads are. The same with this. We kind of, I stumbled on just doing this thing is like knowing what the category was doing and then just saying we don't do that. So this was um, the campaign, it was 501, and then it was loose fit, um, and then it was slim, and it was relaxed. Uh, it was 501 for women, um, and it won a gold line. John Haggerty, who was the founder and legend of BBH, um, loved this campaign and took it to Europe and it ran in the UK. So out of South Africa, I was living up to John Hunt's thing, he's like, we're gonna take over the world with great ideas. So for the, it was a big deal. Um, it was such a simple thing. Um, and you notice none of, you know, we were just low budget, massive ideas with no money, <laughs> was kind of our thing. Um, so, um, oh, I had it, you know, going to Cannes, because it seems kind of like shallow, chasing awards. It can seem like a, a fickle thing to do. But what it did, to, you know, when, it, when you go to Cannes, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful festival. You meet amazing people. It's like advertising community, the, the creative community get together. Um, we went to St. Paul de Var. It's, uh, it's where Picasso and Cezanne and Matisse used to go in summer. Uh, there's a little restaurant where there's actual Picasso scratchings in the tables. There's a Matisse uh, wind chime. Uh, I think Cezanne did some tiles for their swimming pool. So it was like, Matt, it's like you gotta go. You gotta win, but then you gotta go get like the full, like, man, I was, you can imagine if you suck that in, it just makes what you do even better. Um, so, this is kind of like another chapter. I'd, um, I've, I found that I was like trying to find 
things to do that weren't the expected. Th those are the hard ones to do well. You know, we had BMW as a client, and it was like kind of a tricky thing to work on the big uh, budget BMW film. So I was kind of had this um, this way of working and that you can use this is finding the 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 ugly brief, and no one was watching you. You know, <laughs> no one's expecting anything. Um, so I do that today still. So this was for Chiquita Bananas. And uh, it was a little radio brief. And uh, we did this. I did this with a few friends in the agency. We just recorded it ourselves. One hundred percent banana, chiquita bananas. <laughs> banana, banana, na na na, banana, 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 na 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 banana, na 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 banana. One hundred percent banana, chiquita bananas. <laughs> banana, banana, na, banana, na, banana, 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 na, banana, na, banana. Percent banana, chiquita bananas. <laughs> so I mean, these everyone was talking about these for a, for a few months in South Africa, uh, and then everyone in the agency wanted to work on radio after this. <laughs> um, and it's th this camp. This is mostly a bunch of art directors doing radio, um, which I thought was like that's why we didn't go to a recording studio. Uh, we didn't do the we didn't do the correct stuff. You can hear it's kind of a little messy and a little um, a little gritty, but I think that's the charm. So then I broke into America <laughs> uh, at the one show with that. Um, so moving on, I, I moved to London. I moved to Saatchi and Saatchi, and then I was sent to Dubai to work at uh, Saatchi as a regional creative director. Uh, like six agencies and it was just like South Africa because it, um, it was a brand new country it didn't have all the infrastructure that you know here um, I'll tell you the story when I, when I moved to the US how things change <laughs> um, so MTV which kind of now you know it's like HBO now or it's like Netflix today but MTV at that point this is like uh, in 2003 around there uh, MTV was still a, a bit of a force. Um, so we, w he has, we did like a hundred little spots and I just have one, which w one of my favorites. Uh, again, it was just, we actually did this in the agency with a, the little cyber shot camera. Go, 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 go. The thing I'm most proud of is we flipped the logo. Uh, this was uh, MTV Europe that were 
in charge in, of the Middle East, and obviously with the rabbit, you know, reading uh, right to left, this was kind of a little joke, but they were like, "Man, that's great! Let's do it!" So our whole campaign uh, was, uh, you know, MTV the wrong way around. And it's kind of a, a such a brave thing to do to your logo, um, but it was it felt like we were doing something completely uh, new. Okay. Um, I think some of those things, like Chiquita Bananas, you know, and MTV, you kind of expect some, some interesting work. Uh, so here was Dubai Metro, it was a new transport authority. It was like, you know, that, that big, serious, logistical, uh, kind of very complex uh, problem to get across and advertise and communicate and do stuff. Um, however, this was uh, during, we were about to launch and you know, 2008, the end of 2008 was the, that um, massive uh, financial crisis. And while we were launching the Dubai Metro, which was the state of the art rail system, uh, air rail system that they built, with cost, you know, cost billions, it was beautiful and it was gonna change transport uh, in Dubai all the way through to Abu Dhabi. Um, the crisis meant that expats who are 90% of the population, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of expats were losing jobs because companies were, were, you know, shrinking. And the thing to do in Dubai was just leave. So people would pack their stuff, catch a flight back to New York, catch a flight back to South Africa, flight back to Paris, flight back to Sydney. And all these cars were just starting to gather dust. So this was, a, this was on CNN at the time. It was like the, you know, there were, um, I think at one point there was 100,000 abandoned cars in the city. So we started to, we used them for the metro. This was, um, we started to ride on the cars. <laughs> I haven't left Dubai. I'm just using the metro. I'm just love the metro. So, <laughs> metro one, car zero. Stop riding on me. I'm using the metro. <laughs> Watch me if you want. I'm still using the metro. So, um, I love this campaign because uh, it's kind of resonated. And, and this is kind of, I guess, the beginning of a different, where advertising was morphing into a different thing. My early stuff was like ads. And then this was doing something else. It was just riding on a car with your finger. Uh, and, and this got picked up and it was on Sky News. It was on uh, CNN. People in Dubai were writing their own messages. So I started to realize how this was, the, you know, it was all the rage back then was how to do stuff that people would participate in. That's kind of new communication where you don't just beam messages to people. It was like you get people to interact with what you're doing. It's kind of the beginning of a, a, a new way of thinking as a, as a creative person. So that was kind of fantastic. Um, and you can kind of, something similar happens here. So I moved to America. So this is when I come to the US. Um, when I was working uh, in Dubai, I worked on Coca-Cola. Um, I met the global folks and we were doing some crazy fun work and then I moved to America, to Atlanta, to work on Coca-Cola primarily. Um, and then my background <laughs> of stealing silly small things and, and making big stuff uh, was perfect because my, kind of my challenge to me was why didn't Kennedy had the big like massive um, Coke account. Fitzgerald did all the all the localized regional stuff. So it was like we were trying to steal uh, the bigger things from White and Kennedy. So we were trying to go from a 10 million revenue to like 100 million. Coke was in our backyard. Um, so here's some here's another radio, non-radio. This was um, this was the the spot 
it was like the, the brief was like um, Coke and Six Flags uh, the, 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 the year before spring break this was the exact script and they just wanted a refresh on this it was like this spring break go for extreme fun and extreme Coke refreshment at Six Flags nothing thrills like Six Flags rides or refreshes like ice cold Coke go big this spring break at Six Flags Magic Mountain now open daily save $25 with any can of Coke see can for details coca-cola open happiness it was like a 15 second bumper and i was like are you kidding me <laughs> it's like what um so we had a we had a great idea and we just said we'd do the same spot again but we'd do it a little differently So what was a radio brief, and we <coughs> recorded a radio spot, that sound ran on radio. Um, but we, we, you know, I guess the story here is we, we went to, we were on a shoot in LA, we went to Six Flags there, we took a GoPro, we found a guy, <coughs> we recorded that, we walked into the um, Coke the, the following week, and they were expecting that radio spot, and we played that, and they were like, geez, this is amazing. So they put that all over their online platforms, it became like a full online campaign. It was on all the screens at all the Six Flags. So it was like, it became a video asset, it was content. Um, we made like, we made more for summer. Um, that exploded. So it's kind of like, you know, the message there is those little things, oh, man, it's so easy because they're under the radar and you're not, ex you know, there's no pressure. No one would have stopped us from doing that because no one cared, you know. Um, so this kind of, the fact that that goes into other places, I think is um, kind of where, this is more of a, just a pause for a moment where I thought in my, where things change a little bit because we're going into, like this is the world we live in today. Um, where I said before it was simple and kind of ideas ruled. Um, so at face value, this picture kind of elicits that kind of self-righteous judgment associated with today's society. That's kind of the online <coughs> comment on this. It's like, geez, that's appalling. Like, damn. So I beg to differ. <laughs> I think, and you can probably guess at it, I think... Um, <laughs> 
instead of a bunch of uh, teenagers in an art gallery in deep cell phone trance, oblivious to the striking beauty of the sublime painting hanging, hanging lonely on the wall behind them. I think instead this is an argument, um, this is personally, I see a bunch of youngsters googling that very painting. What nearly everyone seemed to miss was this is a very 21st century phenomenon. In a digital reality, the painting was, at that precise moment, the primary screen. So this is kind of a big deal, you know, because this is like 10 years ago. But I think at that point, it's, if you're not aware of how things are, are being digested, you know, then you, that's when you get left behind. So from an advertising perspective, I just want to read what I wrote here. This is called double screening, the moment when something in a TV commercial or a piece of branded entertainment makes us reach for Google is one that should be frozen, framed, and hung in every ad agency's reception. It's the moment of genuine personal curiosity <coughs> that drives people to dig deeper into what they see. That's what matters. So it's so liberating. So now if you are doing a poster or a billboard or a print ad, do it so that people go to another screen to like find out more. It just opens up like what you do now. So I love it because the painting is, is old school canvas, <laughs> but it's like, it's a perfect part of society today. Um, so I think not many brands still grasp this. A true integrated campaign is not the one that pushes invitations across channels, thinking it will collect air miles the further it goes. It's not even a matter of traditional versus digital. Real deep integration now happens when one channel can generate the kind of interest that makes your audience willingly and deliberately take the time to explore another and another and move from one screen to the next, whether that screen is electronic or the canvas variety. So, you know, that's where I think there's l missed interpretation of like what we do in, in terms of design and advertising. Um, so, here's a, you know, so this was uh, in America still, and it's, it's how I demonstrate how I've kind of started doing that type of stuff. Um, so, Bulwark is a brand I bet you none of you know. It's a, it's a massive, uh, massive brand, it's part of the Vanity Fair group, and it's fireproof clothing. <laughs> So obviously you, you don't know it and you don't need to. Um, they make massive revenue for oil and gas industries, uh, construction, you know, all those electrical uh, engineers and pylon guys wearing jeans. Those jeans are flame resistant. So this, was, uh, this is part of a holding company that owns um, Wrangler and um, North Face and uh, Doc Martens, so they, they're kind of a cool uh, holding company, and this is like their, one of their unknown money makers. So the irony is here, they came to us asking for print. <laughs> like, who does this anymore? Um, so th this is the category of this horrible category <laughs> of safety, fireproof clothing, Carhartt and all those. So th they just wanted to do some print. And so we were like, that's definitely, we're not gonna do that. Um, so we, we built, we, we constructed a paper sculpture. Um, and this kind of harkens back to, you know, that Honda thing. It's a little inspiration from that. This is, um, we got Jeff Nishinaka, paper artist, pretty renowned, to um, work on this art. And it took him a year, it took him 11 months to make the sculpture. The idea, you know, so the story is that um, life is fragile. Uh, if these guys really care about people more than just um, selling fireproof clothing. So we would, we would construct this, this beautiful <coughs> sculpture. Um, we'd have great assets for for print. Um, the, 
The true idea is the film we made. So we made this documentary of Jeff making the sculpture. It's an eight-minute film, so I'll kind of skip through it. When I was a kid, I would spend hours in my dad's workshop. It was like one big playground for a kid. It kind of was like a natural progression to go from his workshop in the garage to uh, my studio working with paper sculpture because I'm still working with my hands, still working with some of the basic tools that I used that were his. They have a certain kind of energy to it that I, I can't explain it, but that just only comes through, through usage. And when I do need them, they're there and they still work like they did 60 years ago. In the beginning, everything looks like an explosion in a form. It becomes something that's recognizable. Sorry, I'm just something that no one would ever see, but I don't know it's there. If it's not done just right, it really bothers me. So paying attention to detail is something that's very important to me. And, and it's something very personal, knowing that I've done something that I can be proud of. My favorite sayings, and I'm not quite sure who said it, you know, within this block of marble, it, there already exists the sculpture. All I'm doing is releasing it. I kind of like to think that what I'm doing is taking these flat sheets of paper and basically releasing this thing that already exists. I'm just the one that's just translating this from one life form to another. We took it to a quarry, this kind of little film within the film. We obviously set it alight. so much life into this thing to see it go so quickly is, is actually quite frightening. It, it just shows you how precious life is and, and how in a blink of an eye, in an instant, you can lose everything. So we, so we made this film, um, eight minute film, it took him a year to construct, it took 90 seconds for it to burn to the ground. Uh, we launched this website um, it had you know all the, you know, the, the like five cameras going for a year um, the the print campaign is actually the PR <laughs> so we 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 did premieres for the film at safety conventions like a massive safety convention we launched it in Denver where everyone in that industry who was you know BP uh, New York Underground were all there. Um, they they signed a contract with uh, the New York subway for like 25 million at the premiere. Uh, it made a huge impact. I think all their, you know, as opposed to just having a booth at a safety convention, this was much bigger. And like, that's funny because that's the, the print campaigns here. Um, so th I think that's, 
like the the four hundred thousand mm -hmm. budget we had for a print campaign turned into like a two million production to make a film. Uh, client was obviously brave and um, and like on board, uh, but the it it the the satisfaction of it working was amazing. They they uh, made so much from it. Um, so then I'm almost done. Here's here's something a little more kind of conventional because um, sometimes you can you know you get to make a nice film and that's good enough so this was kind of payback from all this other stuff I'd done on coke where um, they said you can uh, make this pretty big budget film uh, I'm so proud of this this didn't win any awards but it, uh, I got to work with um, a hero um, Aaron Rule from Napoleon Dynamite fame. Uh, the client loved what we were doing on other things so we, we had a bit of leeway here but I, I just love this because it's kind of like it's it's such a non for me it's a non coke cola film. The the wardrobe is kind of you'll see Aaron's touch on it uh, the casting of our characters were like not your typical American kids kind of a little more goofy and like nerdy um, but so beautiful because of that um, so, uh, like a 60 second cinema film sometimes is awesome too. I could not forget the time I first laid eyes on you. I knew. such a lovely story you know young kids who go to Six Flags in summer like there's always love in the air for them they just like <laughs> hanging out with friends so it was this falling gravity falling and falling in love we let Aaron like make this storyline uh, and that's kind of rare you know because normally it's like got to have some selling in it and it's, I felt that was just uh, like a little bit of leeway to do something uh, special um, so in closing getting close to finishing um, so I've got all this is like some stuff but most of this isn't in my portfolio I have a you know a different look when it comes to my my work that I like to show um, I was brought to Columbus to work at GSW and it's like you would like why <laughs> with this stuff and I think it's uh, Life has a way of putting you in the right place at the right time. Because um, I kind of felt uh, healthcare uh, in general was like this, uh, this category of mediocrity. Uh, the clients being the, the problem, thinking that you can't do nice things in health. When, you know, I think I've seen examples of the most profound work today uh, in health. So it's, uh, I'm, I think I have, uh, you know, the, the background to do something meaningful. You know, I'm so excited to be, th you, can, you can tell this is like my dream, like a, an industry that uh, is lazy or, or dull and all they need is a shakeup. So it's a massive challenge. Um, and I have this um, Jobs Clow. As a as a thing, you know, Steve Jobs, uh, and it kind of goes back to my five year old at the beginning. You know, it's really about magic and passion, and this is like trying to save lives, trying to prolong lives could be the most profound thing you can do as a creative person. 
So I've, I've had this at work as well when we in meetings and we, you know, we're pitching on big, big, <coughs> boring healthcare brands who um, don't, shouldn't be. So this is a, this is a, a passage from, from, from the great, this biography on, on Steve's life. Um, and he's kind of, he's recounting, uh, he phones Lee Clow because uh, he wants him to pitch on Apple again. He worked with Lee in the early days, they did 1984. And this is like 10 years later in the 90s where the, you know, Apple have moved to, uh, I think they've moved to DDB. He calls Lee and he says, uh, uh, where's this, he says, uh, uh, Lee, I need you to come up to San Francisco and pitch on Apple. And you, Lee Klaus says, you know we don't pitch. You know our work. Um, Jobs begs him. Long story short, he, he ends up going to, to, do, to show them some work. But this paragraph here where he says, and this is Steve, this was like, t you know, towards the end of his life. You know, this is where he's, he's thinking of stuff that made a big difference to him and Apple. Um, now, it's amazing because for me, this is, he's talking about being in a meeting, in, an, in a presentation. You know, these, are, these aren't like the most emotional things normally. But he's recounting this meeting. <laughs> and he says, this chokes me up. This really chokes me up. It was so clear that Lee loved Apple so much. He was the best guy in advertising, and he hadn't pitched in 10 years. Yet here he was, and he was pitching his heart out, because he loved Apple as much as we did. He and his, t he and his team had come up with this brilliant idea, Think Different, and it was 10 times better than anything any other agency showed. It choked me up, and it still makes me cry to think about it, both the fact that Lee cared so much, and also how brilliant his Think Different idea was. Every once in a while, I find myself in the presence of purity, purity of spirit, and love, and I always cry. It was always, it always just reaches in and grabs me. That was one of those moments. That was a purity about that I will never forget. I cried in my office as he was showing me the idea, and I still cry when I think about it. Jeez, wow. Like, I'm like, W you know, so if you, if you bring that story into a room of people getting ready to go into a meeting, you go like, man, are we going to be, like, are you involved enough, passionate enough? Like, do you believe in your idea enough? Can you walk into a room and make your, your audience cry, make them, make them tear up, make them, like, feel something? You know, and that's, where that, that's when great brands connect to the world. Um, so that's just such a beautiful story. You know, when you're doing stuff and it feels a little boring, you're doing something wrong. I think, you know, when it feels too correct and you're taking all the boxes, probably not awesome. Um, so finally, I'm going to show you this and it's kind of like, as, as I say, as like creatives, whatever discipline, if it's industrial design or art direction or writing like purpose of what you do daily i'll finish with that and this is uh this was something that was made uh for a company for its people wasn't meant to be um, broadcast to the outside world but uh, i kind of think if you think this could be your purpose again i'd say this would be an awesome one to follow
So that's me and my dad. <laughs> my dad was a businessman. <laughs> uh, he he def desperately wanted me to be one too, you can tell. Um, so I'm going to finish with this. When I, when I announced to my poor father that I considered a career as a creative professional, he laughed and cried. He wanted so badly for his son to have a real job. Little did he know, 30 years ago, how important creating stuff would be. When you make things, you become a part of a long chain of human effort that stretches back to the first humanoids who storyboarded their hunting efforts on cave walls. All the way through history, the invention of the wheel, the building of ancient cities and all the great wonders of the world, including cathedrals, the Great Wall of China, all the way to things that take us to tomorrow, the International Space Station, probes that are flying out of our solar system. Okay, so maybe your first job will be to design a logo. Not exactly pushing the human race forward, but the act of designing a logo opens a conversation with a business about its purpose in this world. When you create an identity based on that truth, you can help shape reality and make the world a tiny bit better for that business, its stakeholders, and the people it touches. What will you add to our fine human tradition of making things? How will you push us forward? How will you live beyond our final breath and create something that the next generation will discuss in the centuries to come? Thank you. On behalf of the human race, I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. So that, yeah, thank you so much. I, I don't know like what, what the timing was. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know if, uh, do, do you have questions? What did your father do? He was a pilot. Yeah. 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 He was an airline pilot. Yeah. So when it comes to advertising and all that, we have seen like this big movement of, uh, you know, um, advertising agencies open up. Um, well, which was last year in 2017, but, you know, social media and Facebook and Instagram and all that. How did that affect what you were doing, you know, until Sure. Today? Yeah. I think, I, I mean, I didn't really get into it, but I touched on it. I think that's the, that's the most exciting part of what we do today. We were talking earlier uh, where before it was, um, we were doing ads. And I think today we are solving problems. So if you, give you an example, uh, you've got all this stuff out there where people hate advertising because they can avoid it, they don't have to watch it, you know, you can, everything's streamed. So it, f it has forced communication to change, you know, so um, imagine a brief, I'll use this example where, um, and this is kind of nice because it's in the healthcare space, uh, it's um, the problem is, or the or the, the issue is, s drinks being spiked. Women go out, and there's the danger of being taken advantage of with um, s your drinks being spiked. So, before I was saying to Merce, before I think ten years ago, an agency would have made a big film, made a TV ad, and then put it onto like social things, and to create awareness. What the agency did was create a uh, paper bracelet, like you like you get if you go to a nightclub or a concert. It was one of those bracelets, but it had a tester kit on the bracelet. So you would, if you had a glass of wine, you put your finger in the wine, put it on the test section of the bracelet, and if it turned blue, the drink was spiked. So that was that was an agency's solution. So. As an example, I think what's happening is, you know, the, the Nike uh, original wristband was from AKQA in San Francisco. Um, contemporary advertising is coming up with solutions, which are so interesting, as opposed to doing ads. You know, so I think like Alexa through Amazon can now, has software, there's potentially software, so if you're at home and you cough, Alexa will pick it up 
and we'll check in with you to see if you're okay. Alexa will ask if you want a virtual consult. Uh, she can do that or, or book an appointment. Um, this is an agency doing work which is non-advertising anymore. It's kind of doing software for a smart speaker. So, I mean, a long way of answering your question. I think it's like amazingly exciting. <laughs> Yeah. First, I thank you very much for being here and really love your story that you shared. Thank you. It was about the big idea, about the passion involvement in your work and the commitment to the idea and the confidence to be able to get that idea across the finish line, right? Yeah. Great concept, you got to get across that finish line. And maybe for some younger folks getting into this world, you know, you won the pencil right out of the gate for. I'm sorry, the AD, A and A, A yeah. and, yeah, AD. D and AD, yeah. Yes, thank you, D and AD, yes. thank you. Um, you know, I believe of the softest or smallest voice comes the biggest idea. What about those that are maybe not that confident that they, uh, you know, what's your advice to them to, to learn to speak up and sure. share their big idea? Good question, because, I, you know, I'm not the most um, bold and, and, and like out there in terms of, you know, you get some really confident, creative people who can really persuade people. I learned from John, who was like very subtle. Um, so the so the, the the good news is, if you be yourself and you care, it's amazing. You know, I think clients love someone who takes time. Like that passage from Steve Jobs saying, "Lee clearly loved Apple." Um, I've always, I've, you know, if they're workshops for presentations, I hate those because it will turn people into confident presenters. I hate rehearsals. Um, you know, so something I'm trying to do at work now where we, we try and be smooth and slick and it's the worst thing to be. Um, I came to one of uh, the school's presentations a few months ago. There were five presentations. Uh, and the winning presentation was probably the most shy group. But man, they were like so charming. And like, I think that, you know, we voted for the winner and they won, not just because of that, but because I think there was a, there is, something happens. Uh, you know it when you see it, when someone's not really, they're just super slick. So I think there's, there's total space for, uh, the unexpected, the quiet, the, you know, it's actually, in, you know, use it in your favor, it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask about creativity a bit because I, I look at things like your Six Flags video and how do you know that you got the right guy, that you have the right idea, you start off with a radio ad and you turn it into a film. How did, where does that creative spark come from, and how many ideas ended up on the floor in a bottle, you know, wrapped yeah. up in a piece of paper, and so that one's not good? How do you know when to run with something and when to kind of say, no, that's not it? There's no answer. <laughs> to the, no, I mean that's the, it's such a great thing to to keep questioning. Um, it, for me, it boils down to the that. Thing I said at the beginning, which was like you know just being uh, believing in something, and that's kind of the hardest thing because there's no way to know. Like there was no way to know anything up front if it's going to work or not, if it's different. Um, there's you know like the last film we saw from from Apple, which it, you know a thousand no's for every yes. I think that's kind of the thing is like be like excruciatingly tough on the idea you know so don't stop until the idea is scary I mean that's a nice way for me to I think if I was talking about like how to judge an idea if it makes you uncomfortable that's when it's good that's normally when people don't like it but when it's uncomfortable and it's um, it's frightening it's better um, you know, so it's the inverse to everything people feel. Um, 
what else? Well, I was going to say something there. I think it's um, the the risk is failure. You know, so the the roller coaster could have been silly and not had any kind of merit, um, and it would have just been a an experiment. And then we would have learned from it. I think you know, great companies also, you know, you have to fail. Um, I think we, if we work in a, an environment where failure is like a bad thing, it's it's a problem for us. Where failure should be like a welcome thing. It's tough. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so building on that idea that great ideas make, should make everyone feel comfortable. I, the thing that struck me the most is how you, on an individual level, creativity that's inspiring. But when you're dealing with tens of millions of dollars and you're dealing with corporations, the fact that you can sustain creativity within those cultures, to me, is astounding. And how do you resist, over the years, this, what I call the certainty vortex, that no matter how many successes you've had in the past, eventually the metrics close in on you like thickets. And they want to, and they want more and more guarantees. They want, there's always somebody, when we saw it last, the last speaker, we, we want more and more rational frameworks so that we can control the outcome. And yet, time and time again, you're defining that with bigger and bigger plans and bigger and bigger risk. Yeah. So I, I find that sociologically implausible. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by how you, you've been able to do that in your career. Yeah, you know, I think that's the, that's the secret of getting, getting people to feel something. Um, you know, it's also, you know, I've worked with Richard Branson as a client, and then you can do anything because he gets it because he's in he's he's like he wants to do great things you know I think um, to your point a lot of clients are don't want to do great things they want to spend their money wisely they want to save some money so they look good you know so your marketing department is kind of your worst enemy in in you know on average if you find you know I've always found uh, the person who's who's like genuinely wants to do something because uh, that's what you need you know it is a it is dependent on being uh, persuasive and and then the thing that happens is then you become a like a force to be reckoned with as a group because it's frightening and you you go together um, I, d I, I have a few failures obviously um, and you always bounce back you know and it's kind of um, it seems foreign in in this country because you know I didn't say it at the time but I think like we know working in some other cultures where there's n you know there's no there's no um, infrastructure to do the stuff we do in the US in terms of like how marketing works how testing works, how focus groups work. Um, some places, uh, there's also like, if someone's naive and you and you sell them something, they don't even know how good it is. That's another way of doing things. There's, you know, it's a it's, it's a weird way, but it's um, you can take advantage of people's um, generosity as well. <laughs> It yeah. seems like, I don't know if this is true all over the world, but it seems like I see uh, businesses a lot of times, their marketing department will say, change your logo. And it's the marketing people, I think, that are sometimes driving that. I don't know. But um, talk a little bit about yeah. uh, logos and, <coughs> you know, the businesses change them too often or is it better to you know you keep trying until you find one iconic you know yeah because you, you start uh, losing that recognition for what sure that business is. yeah um you know i think you immediately see it when something's unnecessary and uh, there's kind of like a damaging of identity um you know i think logo is like is like a sacred um it's yeah, it totally is you know and i th i'm 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 normally in favor for less evolution and more just ownership you know ge you kind of over time things become more powerful 
I'd hate to think how um, you know Apple would change that beautiful icon. Uh, there was uh, Pepsi. Uh, they did an update like ten years ago, yeah. something like that, and the presentation was leaked online. I don't know if you remember that. So they just spent like a half a billion dollars with Landor on a new evolution, and the leaked presentation was was ridiculous because it was it was so bad. It was like the you know they just changed the the curves so that the negative shape uh, they 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 equated it to like the universe and the you know the fluctuation of energy and uh, <laughs> black holes that surround things and all that <coughs> bullshit <laughs> was in that presentation. It was a hundred slide presentation, but they got him. It was like five hundred million dollars <laughs> of like careful stewardship of a brand, but it was all it was all a joke. It was a, like a complete farce. So when it when that thing leaked, you you can if you remember, it was um, kind of a an exposing of the craziness that a marketing department with their agency or their design um, partner would like get in, in a boardroom would talk such nonsense um, and think they you know for they doing something valuable for the company well I, I think that sometimes companies change the logos and people are comfortable with what's familiar so the ads could be different but I think a lot of people are not comfortable because they when logos change too much with a business because then they're not sure what that yeah. business is you know, there's there's another school of thought. I guess you could um, you could be completely uh, adventurous by changing it radically. Like that would be f for me. That would be refreshing. It'd be like you know, if uh, if um, Google did something really crazy, as opposed to just like changing the font a little bit or tweaking it. That's kind of the more they expected evolution. Um, maybe there's you know. Again, the whole point of like, do it differently, like it's never been done before. Change everything. Uh, that would be exciting. So that flies in the face of everything, in s you know, keeping something original. You know, Mark, I, I like the, I just want to point out the comment you made. Sorry, Mike, I see that there are more questions there than the students. I just want to make a comment. Yes. Less evolution and more ownership of who you are. I think that's not just good for business. I actually think that's good personal life. So I just I thought that was a nice. very worthwhile comment. Nice. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks. As somebody who has never really been a fan of advertising, you're helping me see it in a different way, a more human way, so to speak. Yeah. Um, my question isn't about advertising or uh, you know, your career itself. It's about your personal work. Do you have personal work, or do you see your personal work as being your I do, I do, I paint, um, I, I draw a lot, but I paint, yeah, so that's kind of, and it's, you know, it's, it's nothing to really talk about, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I'd love it's painting, yeah. Energy, you know, like yeah. Is it all spent on other people, or do you reserve some, you know, for yourself to, to make sure that you're just not giving all your ideas away, you know, yeah. keep some for yourself? Yeah. I mean, that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm guilty of um, putting all my time into uh, work because it's kind of life. Um, so, you know, things happen, uh, but I, I kind of, I look back and I, th you know, it's, it's a cliche, but if you, if you are working all the time and you do what we do, it's, it's never work. It's like, it's just, it's inspiration, it's observation, it's like an idea is lurking around every corner. It's that cliche, but it's, um, if you, I think if you switch it off, and then you go work and you try and come up with ideas of work, that's the, that's when it's hard. You know, then your life is separate, and work is separate, and it somehow doesn't work for, for creativity. Um, it's true. It's it's really true. I think if you, you you know the people who live what they do, 
um, it's like the, the the best writers or the uh, or the people who are completely obsessed with writing. I have a question. I'm curious. How do you go about your your process? Do you sit down and brainstorm and think, what is the craziest thing I can do for this client, or how does this how does this happen? So. The, the, the truth is, yes. I think for the beginning of my career, it was all on me. Like for the first you know, five or six years, I was, I was uh, judged on what I did. Um, and that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, and I loved that. It was like, it was painful, you know, it's torturous, it's pressure. It's like, you know, to Every day was a failure because I'm not going to be able to do this tomorrow because I don't have good ideas. And that elusive idea saves you as a tortured creative person. If it's designing a logo, if it's writing a, a headline, no matter what it is, coming up with a thing. Um, but today, you know, I became a creative director when I was 29. So my whole, um, wh what did you say, what is my... Your process. My process, yeah. My whole process is now helping people do great things. So I think half of what I showed you, more than half, because so, some of that was early work, is what people do around me. Because I feel I give them um, the space and the environment and the, and the freedom to, to, to do that stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. So my process now is really, you know, m everything I do seldom is it my idea very it's hardly ever um, it's just helping and that's important that's a great question because you know that's maybe that was what I loved doing the most was um, giving people uh, the opportunity to do that and a lot of people don't get that sure. from you know I met Dan Wyden uh, in you know 20 years ago and he said something similar he said he he started his agency, uh, no idea they'd be successful. Um, he just, it was just a place where people could come and get away from the crazy world. It was like a nursery school for, for, for um, people who wanted to do interesting things. That was his, it was a simple philosophy. He didn't have like a secret that helped them do great things. 